It's wonderful to see all, all of y'all today and welcome visitors and those of y'all who are just showing up. Um, thank y'all for coming. We are moving down the line of our lessons and we're here in uh, John chapter 9 and we're going to do 9 and 10 today. We are working on the lessons for January. You are going to have the best time in January. The lessons are wonderful, but we got to get through Matthew before we go to January, but I am having the greatest time. We're going to start in January, and so spread this to your news, to your friends. We're going to tell the start and tell the story of the Bible in order, starting with God before creation and everything we know about it all the way through to the end. And we're going to put everything where it belongs. You know, most people don't realize, but in the Old Testament, when you study Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, Esther, Nehemiah, um, and uh, Ezra, you've got the Old Testament history. That's it. Everything else in the Old Testament fits somewhere in those stories. And we're going to put all that where it belongs, and then we'll go move on in the story all the way through the New Testament, which is where we've been for three years. It is just incredible. It is just, I am already thrilled. The people who are editing and, and uh, for me already are just excited about it. They, they're enjoying it. They say, oh, this is so good. They write me back. No, they never do that about these lessons for some reason. They never write, this is so good. You know, they just don't. They just put red marks on it and send it back and for me to correct and me send out again. So we're going to do that as we're going to tell the story. And the reason why that is, and you've heard me while we're doing this, we here at Sagemont do a wonderful, wonderful job of getting people saved. But one of the things we don't do a good job is providing a place where they can learn about God quickly enough before they get dumped into a Bible study class like ours that goes broad or some Bible study class that wants to go deep and they're just sinking their swimming, just you know, trying to keep, keep up. And we need to get them through so they know the stories of the Bible, specifically the people who are in the stories and how it all fits together so they'll understand why Jesus came to do what he did for us because it was all part of God's plan. So as we pick up, we have got Jesus. He has been in the uh, temple teaching during the Feast of Booths, and he's just come out of the temple. In fact, if you remember, they've picked up stones to stone him as he's leaving the temple. He comes out of the temple, and there is a man there that he sees who has been blind since birth. And he goes over to him, and he's going to heal him. That's where we pick up here. Pick up in verse 2 of chapter 9. I've already told you about verse 1. He says, And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, the, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. I do not understand that. I understand it, but I don't want to understand it. You know how you get in your heart and you don't want to understand something? Now, if you had been, uh, for instance, I heard coming in this morning, I heard a testimony by Joni, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, who uh, in high school jumped into a lake, broke her neck, became a quadriplegic, came to the Lord, and has just displayed the mighty works of God in an incredible way through her tes testimony. I can understand that. I can understand us having to go through the burden of losing our parents or losing our brother and sister and displaying the mighty works of God through that. I can understand that. I can understand us getting cancer, getting over it, displaying the mighty works of God, or getting cancer, not getting over it, and through the last days of our life, displaying the mighty works of God so that I can understand all that. But being born blind from birth and displaying the mighty works of God. I have a hard time with that. However, what this blind man is fixing to do is absolutely incredible because really and truly the Sanhedrin, it's kind of been kind of even Stephen between Jesus and the Sanhedrin and the arguments for the last two years. But now when they come and they hit this blind man and they're going to expel him from the Sanhedrin, they're going to ex communicate him from the Sanhedrin. He is not going to be allowed to get the services of the Sanhedrin any longer. He's going to hammer it. So if the disciples are saying to Jesus, because there's a philosophy of thought, that if a person is blind or is an ailment or whatever, you remember when you were growing up, some people said, you must be a sinner because you're wearing glasses. 
Of course, the older we get, we all get some sort of glasses. Some of you I know, you're not wearing glasses, but I can see that flicker in your eye where you've had a little glass thing put in there, a little plastic thing. <laughs> that implant, dumiflotchy, it looks kind of like an octagon thing sitting in there and flickering off your You know, we, we're getting old in our eye. That's not from us doing something sinful. But their theology in that day was if something's wrong with you, if you're lame, if you're blind, if you're sick, if you're paralyzed, it's because either you sinned or your parents sinned. And Jesus is plain here. It's not his parents' fault. It is not his fault. It was for the glory of God that this man was blind from birth. Now, I have problems with that with Jeremiah. Look at the very first thing of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Jeremiah is born, the, the Old Testament prophet, and the Lord says to him, do not take a wife, do not have children, because you're going to speak for me. I have chosen you from birth. I knew you were when you were in the womb. By the way, that is a promise to Jeremiah and to Jeremiah alone. Now, if you want that promise for you, you've got to go someplace else in the Bible to get it. So don't use the Jeremiah passage, because that's talking to Jeremiah and Jeremiah alone, that he was picked by God, designated, ordained to speak the words of the Lord to the people, and lo and behold, they don't like anything he's saying. Absolutely nothing. But he's picked by them, and he's picked from birth, to display the mighty works of the Lord through the word of the Lord. Well, here he says, this blind man has been selected to display the works of God. It is not a sin of anyone. Verse 4, we must work the work of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he has said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Okay, just for a visual. Here's what Jesus does. <laughs> now why they said apply there, those of y'all who are theologues, go look it up. It's the same word used way on down here when... Uh, when they're asking him in verse six, verse ten, he says he uh, verse eleven he says he anointed my eyes with clay. Folks, you don't have to anoint with extra virgin olive oil. <laughs> anoint with whatever you got. And Jesus spit in that clay, picked it up, dirt, put it on his eyes, and said, "Go wash in the pool of Siloam." Well, we've already heard about the pool of Siloam because that's where Jesus was coming into the temple. And he looks at the man and says, "Hey." You've been sick, for, you've been lame for 38 years. Hey, you want to be well? Yeah. Well, get up and walk and take your pallet. And he did it on the Sabbath. Got that? He did it on the Sabbath. And remember, the Sanhedrin just chewed all over him because he did it on the Sabbath. He carried his pallet. He told him to carry his pallet on the Sabbath. Didn't matter that he got healed on the Sabbath, just that he got carried his pallet on the Sabbath. How ludicrous was that? So, verse continuing... He went away and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? And others were saying, This is he. Still others were saying, No, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I'm the one. It's me. It's really me. This is me. No, it can't be him because he's been blind all his life. No, it's not him. Yeah, that's him. No, it's not. Can you imagine what's going on in this temple area? It's me. It's me. <laughs> so they were saying to him, How then were your eyes opened? And he answered, The man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed, and I received sight. And they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I don't know. You know why he didn't know? Because he was blind when he left Jesus. He still had the mud on his eyes, and he didn't receive his sight till he gets over to the pool of Siloam, which is where that man who had been sick for 38, I mean, lame for 38 years was. He gets down in the water, washes his eyes, and he could see. Jesus could have been standing four feet from him, and he wouldn't have known unless he heard his voice whether or not that was Jesus or not. So they're saying, Where is he who did this? I don't know. They were so caught up in their rituals and their regulations about the Sabbath that they had no care about the greater good that Jesus did for this man. 
This is nothing new, folks. This is absolutely nothing new. Sage Mont, I hope, is not a church that's like a church that I'm fixing to, like churches that I'm fixing to you know, give you an example. There are churches out there that say that if you read any Bible but the NIV, you are not reading God's Word. Or unless you read the NASB, you're not God's Word. Now, the biggest group of those is the King James Version, the authorized King James Version, which King James authorized to be the version that was from God. And if it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for us, right? Since Paul didn't came a long time after King James by about uh, 1,660 years. Paul couldn't have read the King James Version of the Bible. We've got other things. We've got people, unless you, unless you baptize in the name of Jesus, you can't baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, you have to baptize in the name of Jesus or you are not saved. A picture thing, but you are not saved because of that. There are groups out there, we have a church that's near to us that, by the way, came out of the Southern Baptist um, denomination. Not out of Sagemont split, but out or a split from Sagemont, but from the Southern Baptist back in the early 1900s. They split from the Southern Baptist. It's not far from here. Uh, a little lady was, was transferred here by uh, her company. And the company um, was in trouble, so they transferred her here. And lo and behold, it wasn't long before the company went out of business and she didn't have a job. And she went to her church, the other church, and they couldn't help her. And she had a few bills and things like that. And we helped a little bit. And then the car broke down and she needed to get back to another state where her parents were because that's where she had a support system. And you know my philosophy on that is if you can't make it here and you've got people someplace else, Paul says families to take care of family before they come to the church, then I would rather us at Sagemont spend the money to get you there with your stuff so that you don't stay here and struggle. You understand? So get where family are there where you can go sleep on the back porch or because you're blood. And lo and behold, while I'm talking to her and I find out from the car issue that this is not something we want to put money in to fix the car, Sally comes in, lays a note on my desk, a new car has just come in, they've just signed the papers outside of, uh, in her office, and I turn around and said, I want you to come down here and see me right now, if you can get here and bring your car insurance, and she does, we transfer the insurance, we transfer the title, $75, she's got a car. In the midst of that, we find out that she's... Uh, already paid to go on a retreat with this other church, but she's been here visiting us for two weeks now. And so I said, go on your retreat, go. I mean, you've paid for it, go. She shows up at the retreat and they ask her, where have you been the last two weeks? And she said, well, y'all couldn't help me, but Sagemont was able to help me, so I went to visit them and they said, you can't stay here at this retreat, even though she had paid for it, because we don't want to have anything to do with those people over there who worship the way they do, because they don't worship the true God and they're not a true church. And it's blocks from here, folks. Blocks from here. Blocks from here. A church that it's past denominational history, it's a splinter off of Southern Baptist. Now I'm going to warn you of something else. If she'd been from a Southern Baptist church, there's a great chance that they might have had the same idea because within five years, we're going to have to decide whether we at Sagemont are going to stay Southern Baptist. And here's the reason why. 95% of the churches that are out there under the new leadership that's coming out with the new gospel that is happening, we are in the minority and the churches out there, are they are getting more and more like the Sanhedrin of their way is the only way, their church is the only church, and they are so restrictive in their gospel that it is becoming um, ungodly. They are so much into a social gospel that it is ungodly. Oh, it seems to be the right thing to do, but it's ungodly. It's no different than the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was more concerned about the survival of the Sanhedrin than they were about the people. 
That happens a lot. This very week, a man comes to my church, felt called of God, went to get his uh, seminary degree, got his seminary degree, has yet to find a church that wants him. Why is that going on? Because uh, God has not raised up a people that want him to be their minister yet. It actually is a very miraculous thing of how God calls people to be the shepherds. Gives them the gift or one of the gifts that are mentioned in Ephesians of being a, a pastor, a prophet, a teacher or whatever. One of those gifts. And then he raises up a people that want him to be their, their shepherd. So I said to the man, I said, you mean to tell me after all this time you have not had a single church that wants you to be their pastor. No, not one. Well, there is one. I said, well, tell me about the one. Well, it's over there in East Texas, almost towards Beaumont. I said, okay. I said, how many times have you talked to them? Oh, they've called me three or four times, and I just I can't go over there. I said, they, they, the little old town, and they named the name of the town. I went, have you been in that town lately? That town has a six lane, that's not even on, it's right off of Highway 10. I go, that town has a six lane, basically highway, basically a highway going right through it, and that's a good church. I know that church. Oh, well, last time I was there 30 years, it was just a little hole in the wall. <laughs> I went, you need to leave my office and you need to call them back right now and you need to say, I do need to come and see if this is where God wants me. When I was raised at First Baptist Waxahachie, there were 32 men who felt called to the ministry that I remember being part of. One was the Philpot, Mr. Philpot. You all remember him because uh, back in the um, 70s, I believe it was, it was while I was in high school, he was a missionary and they were killed on the mission field. The Philpots. That's a pretty big story. They've actually made a movie and some other things. He was from my home church. The other thir uh, there's 31 more, and I was not number 31, but my home church would not ordain me because I was going into music. I wasn't going into being the pastorate. So they ordained the other 30. To this day, today, I am the only one that's still in the ministry. The others never landed. Never landed at all. Why? Because they were called either of themselves or their parents called them to be a minister. And in fact, I've met many that I never felt like God had really called, truly called them because I didn't see people, sheep, coming to them to be led by them. Well, we got this problem. We got this Sanhedrin, which is that same type of people. They're being leadership. Watch what happens here. So they brought the man to the, Pharise uh, to the Pharisees, who was formerly blind. Verse 14. We're going to pick that same topic back up in just a minute. I just, that was a precursor. Now, it was a, it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. We'll do tell. It was always going to be on the Sabbath. You knew that. He healed the man with his palate on the Sabbath. They get mad about the Sabbath because Jesus is breaking the Sabbath laws and the Sabbath regulations. Then this Pharisee also was asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he replied, clay, he applied clay to my eyes and, and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not of God, uh, is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. There it is. They're hung up on their regulations. You see, the Bible says this. It says this right here. You got to do this in Jesus' name. And they don't take it in the whole context of what is being said in the passage. And they yank something and try to prove something with it. In fact, in about 95% of our Southern Baptist churches today, a pastor will go, he will read one verse, and then he'll tell you what he wants to tell you about the rest of the world. And that's it. He's using a proof text to prove his point. And if you'll read the entire context of what he's reading, just like I told you about the Jeremiah passage where he says, I, I knew you when you were in the womb before you were born. That is a promise to Jeremiah. It's not a promise to us. A person wrote a thing up and sent to me, says, what do you think about this this week? And it was from John chapter 14. We're not there yet, but we're heading there. And I said to them, I said, look, 
That's a passage where Jesus is talking only to the apostles because he's already invested in the apostles the ability to do everything he did, including miracles and signs and wonders, and he sent them out twice to do them, and one time they were successful, the next time they come back they failed because they didn't do it according to the way the Lord had sent them out. And he's saying, I've given you everything that you're going to do these signs and you're going to do these wonders to continue on the proof of what Christianity is as our faith in Christ. But he wanted to use it as a proof text. And I pulled back, I said, you can't make those assumptions because we're not apostles. You've got to use it in context. So they come back and they say, look, you can't do this because of the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? Now, this is a pretty long passage. Let's get through it. And I left it intact together on purpose. And there was a division among them. They're arguing. Nicodemus is part of this little group that's kind of battering back of them. He's part of that. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. And the Jews did not believe it was of him, and that he was the blind that had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he see? And the parents answered and said, We know this is our son, and that he was born blind, but how he sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. And they're wanting to get off the hook. They're in their older age, and they don't want to say anything bad. There's a reason why they don't want to say anything bad, because they don't want to be expelled from the synagogue and away from the social services that they provide. I don't make that up. Verse 22, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. And the word put out means disassociated. That's the reason why when the, when the Gentile women, the Gentile women who had become Jews and then came to know Christ as their Savior could no longer go to the synagogue for food and for a drink whenever they were hungry. They had to go and get seven guys to oversee the table so the Gentile uh, Hellenistic women could have something to eat because if you were Jewish... Even though you were part of the way, you could go and you were widowed or orphaned, you could go to the synagogue and eat. Man, they got supplies there. Absolutely they do. They've got offerings being given of lamb and sheep and goats and, and grain and libations of drink and everything else that you can go eat. And they helped people during that in their social gospel. But if you were a Gentile who had converted to Judaism, who was now part of the way, you were out of luck. You could no longer go to the synagogue because you didn't have blood. But if the synagogue, the Jewish people, expelled you as a Jew, you could no longer go. And these parents are older. He is of age. He's got older parents. They don't want to be expelled. Ask him. He's of age. It's him. We don't know what happened to him, but he is our son. But we don't know what happened to him. Going on here in the passage, verse 23. For this reason, his parents said he's of age. Ask him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, he's talking about this man being Jesus is a sinner. He answered, Whether Jesus is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him, What did he do to you? And, he, he, and how did he open his, your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become one of his disciples, do you? <laughs> He's hammering them. He is hammering them. He's fixing to get expelled too. They reviled him and said, You are his disciple and we are the disciples of Moses. You know that God has spoken to Moses, but for the, as for this man, we do not know where he is from. And the man answered, He has been healed by Jesus. He, doesn't, he wouldn't even recognize Jesus if he saw him. And had, had him standing by, and he said, look what he says. <laughs> he says, well, here's an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a blind born, a, a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born entirely in sin. Get on out of here. You're trying to teach us. And they expelled him from the synagogue. He can no longer go back to the synagogue. So he goes out of the synagogue. 
He heads over towards the temple. Over the temple, he's going to find Jesus. Look what happens. And Jesus heard that this man had been put out. And finding him, he said, uh, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, Jews understood the term Son of Man. They knew that to mean to be the Messiah. That's Hebrew or Christ. That's the Greek word. You knew that the Son of Man was the Messiah. So the blind man says, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Who is he? Tell me who he is. So I believe in him. And Jesus said to them, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. I wish he had said that easy. Hey, it's me. I'm it. Okay? Yeah, it's it. You're looking at him. That's how we'd say it. You're looking at him. It's me. And look what the blind man does. Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Now, Jesus is not doing this in a corner. He's not doing this in a closet. He's doing this out where the Pharisees who followed him and followed the blind man can hear and see this. Verse 40, those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said, We are not blind too, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, we see, your sin remains. Since you claim that we have Moses and we have all that we need to know, your sin remains. But if you had been blind and not really known where it was and you'd accepted the Messiah, then you would have been seen because then you would have seen the light that truly comes in the darkness. And truth, Jesus picks up with that and says, Truly, truly, this is a bad chapter break. It's the starting of chapter 10, but it's a bad chapter break. It's a wrong place to be stopping. You've got to keep going. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. Gosh, he is just tearing up the Pharisees. You claim to be able to see, but you're blind. And everyone who's blind doesn't enter the door. And he says, I've come to be the door to the fold of the sheep. And anyone else who's come to be leadership has climbed up there and climbed in a wrong way as a thief and a robber. Most of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes that were part of the Sanhedrin by the day that this is happening have bought their position. They are leaders because somebody had the funds to get them in, either themselves, their family members, or whatever. They are not the leaders of the people because they were elected by the people because you didn't elect the Sanhedrin. You bought the position. You got in there some way, mostly by hook or crook, and they're the leaders, but they're not seeing what God's intent is they're doing what their Sanhedrin says to do and what their laws have said to do that they have made up and they are now just claiming to be the leaders of the people and they are so blinded they are concerned about their survival as leadership instead of the survival of the sheep who are following them folks I cannot tell you how many times I have had to say to not only ministers in our church here and ministers in other churches, especially the young guys that I have to say, you seem to have forgotten where your paycheck comes from. You have gone off on a tangent. Well, let's say you are a leader over 50 and you got 49 of the people who are saying, He's not right. And yet you're claiming to be right and you're trying to lead the people and they won't follow you because you're not going in the right direction. You've lost your leadership. There's a church on the, on the west side of town that had a pastor while I was over, and this was 20 years ago, had a pastor uh, that was there that his, his thing was he was going to build an auditorium as his legacy at that church. The church just balks. They just are not following his leadership because he wants to build this in his name as an honor to his name. Finally, he gets so upset with them, he leaves the church. They bring in a new pastor. It is not six weeks after the new pastor is there that the leadership of the people, the, the leadership of volunteers, come to the pastor and say, Pastor, don't you think we need a new auditorium? And the next thing, it's history. It's built. It's built. But the people were not going to allow that minister who wanted that 
uh, building to be his legacy to build that building because the Lord was not allowing it to happen. We as ministers cannot go out and say, we're going to do this and we're going to do it whether the people follow us or not. Because we, that, what we're doing is we're trying to do something for us and build us up and puff us up like the Sanhedrin is being puffed up. Now folks, it works this way too in every business that you're in. You can have the best stock in the entire town, but if your people who are working for you, people treat the people who are coming through the door like they are dirt or worse than dirt, it doesn't matter what your prices are. It doesn't matter. You can have, if your people come in and they can't find stuff in your store because it's too hard to get around, they'll stop coming because it's too hard to get around, especially if your people aren't helping them get around. And, and servicing them. It works in the church. It works out in the public. If you're not looking out for the survival of the person who's coming through the door, then you're not going to survive as leadership. And it happens in the church too. And the Sanhedrin has forgotten. And most of the leadership is climbing their position. They're concerned about their leadership position surviving, but not the survival of their sheep. Folks, you don't get to choose who the sheep are. Did you know that? It's like your kids. You didn't get to choose your kids and what they'd be like when they came out, did you? No, you got them. For those of y'all who one day may be a pastor or a retired pastor or something like that, you don't get to choose your flock. You don't get to choose them. That's what I was saying to the man that was in my office this week. He said he didn't want to go to this little town because he thought it was podunk town. I said, you don't get that choice. God is, God is the one who raises up the people that want you. God never calls a man to be in a leadership position without calling a people who want him to be their leader. If you're out there and you feel like God has called you in a leadership position and there's nobody wanting you to be their leader, all you're out of doing is having a great walk and studying the Bible. That's it. Because God's not calling these people. If He hadn't called the people to want you, then you're in the wrong place. God's probably calling you to do something else, but you got the wrong words coming into your head from somewhere that you're supposed to be doing leading of the people. Folks, not everybody's supposed to be the leader of the people. Not everybody. Not everybody's supposed to be a leader. Nah. Not everybody's supposed to stand on the mountain and proclaim the coming. No, not that. In fact, very few are supposed to do that. Very few. But God has a place for every one of you, just like He has a place for this blind man that is here. Jesus is talking about that. He goes on to say, He says, um, he says uh, <clears throat> that they've come in, uh, verse 2, but he who enters the door by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. In other words, the Sanhedrin have all climbed in some other way, by a window or through the roof. But if you enter through the door, then you're supposed to be the shepherd of the sheep. Verse 2, to him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of, of strangers. This figure of speech, so thank you, uh, Bible, you're telling us, and the Lord, you're telling us this is a, literally a figure of speech. Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. The Pharisees and Sadducees don't understand. They're the ones who are robbers. They're the ones who are, ones who are trying to lead the people but they're not, they don't have a way to go through the door. Even if the door is open and they try to go through it, they try to call their people, the people, the sheep, are not going to follow this Sanhedrin. They're afraid of this Sanhedrin. Folks, it's like this in our government right now. If we were to line up at a door, and I'll just go ahead and say it, and our president was to open the door and call his followers to come in, It'd be less than 18% of the United States would go in that door. It'd be less than 18%. Maybe less than 15% that would truly go in. Because we're not happy. We are not happy. And we're going in a wrong direction. Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. He's talking about the Sanhedrin. You got that? But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastures. The thief, and he's talking about the Sanhedrin here. He's talking about the false leadership. 
over in the passage where it says, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Go look at the context of that passage. It's talking about the false leaders who are in the world who are trying to lead the people. I know we interpret that another way, but it's talking about false leaders who are humans in this world. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The false leaders, the Sanhedrin, they are not concerned with the sheep, they're concerned with their position and that they get their way. It says, I came that they may have life and they may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and, and not a shepherd, uh, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and he is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Man, he's laying it on. He's coated on thick. The Sanhedrin are out for their own, and not for the good of the sheep. But Jesus comes that he'll even die for the sheep. Jesus goes on to say in verse 16, I have other sheep which are not this, of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Do you know there is a denomination of religious belief out there but believes that's talking about aliens and other, on other planets? Yeah. You know there's another denomination out there, another religion out there that says, oh, that's talking about those of us who found the tablets up in New York and we're those other people in all the churches. They've all gone bad, and so we're the only true churches out there, so you've got to follow our way. No, what Jesus is saying is that he is coming not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentile believers also within the world. Looking at going on. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. He is talking about his authority to die on the cross and to be resurrected. It was the very first thing he said after he came out of the wilderness, after coming off the water out of the baptism. He, he prophesies that he's come to die for the world, for the sins of people. You ever thought about what that cost Jesus and what cost God? How much did that cost God? Hmm. Well, God's the creator of it all. He owns it all. He made it all. He designed it all. He planned it all. It didn't cost him anything. He gave it all. It was a gift. It didn't cost him. It still belongs to him. It didn't cost him a thing. Now, in human terms, we think, well, that cost a lot. But in spiritual godly terms, he just gave the gift of his son to come and die. It's a gift. Accept the gift. Just accept it what it is. It's nothing you can do to get it except to receive it. <laughs> Verse 19, So a division occurred among the Jews because of these words, and many of them were saying, He has a demon and is, and is insane. Why do you listen to him? And others were saying, These are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? So the division happens in the synagogue. So they're arguing. No one is saying in the synagogue he's the Christ yet, because if they do, they're going to get put out. They don't want to do that. But so they're just saying, look, he's debating back and forth and back and forth. This is in October of A.D. 28. We know from the other three Gospels that there's some other things that happen here. In fact, Luke is the one who picks it up and tells us. Jesus leaves that area, and he goes back to Galilee, I mean, he goes, he goes back to Galilee, and John is, not, John is writing to the church to fill in the church on what happened during Jesus' Judean ministry that is not over in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So John does not tell us of these 26 pretty major events that happen in Jesus' life over the next year and three months while Jesus is up in Galilee. doesn't do that. 
He, he just skips on down to verse 22. A whole year transpires. And it says, Now at the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So he goes from the feast of dedication a year and three months. He passes over a Passover. He passes over a feast of dedication. Then a Passover. Then another feast. And gets us down a year and three months later. It's now December of AD 29 and all these events that Luke takes place goes through and we have these things and they're in order. Pretty major events and it takes a year for them to happen. They happen in Galilee and Luke has told us about them so we don't need to know about them again. John's not wasting the space because John is interested in telling the church about what happened in Judea. So Jesus is back down Jerusalem. He is back at the temple and he's on the portico of Solomon. Now, Solomon didn't build that porch, folks. Herod built that porch. If you remember, whenever the temple was destroyed in 586, uh, it was rebuilt after they came back from exile. Then it was just built as a box. I mean, it was just boxy. Well, uh, Herod the Great decides he's going to please the Jews by building the temple. He's going to adorn the, the, the temple that's there, and then he's going to add buildings to it, much like what Solomon had. So he sets out, he lays out a plan, and in 20 B.C., Herod the Great starts building on the temple. Now, if you remember, Herod the Great dies in 4 B.C., but the plans go on. And in fact, by the time we got to John chapter 2 in this study, they had been building for 46 years, and they had stopped building because they ran out of funds. And the Pharisees said to Jesus, said, look... Uh, we've been building on this for 46 years, and you said that you're going to tear it down. If it's torn down, you can rebuild it in three days. How is that possible? Well, that actually is a clue that gives us the date that it's 27 A.D. when that is happening. So, Because we know when Herod started building the temple. So we know it's 27 A.D. Well, we're down in time now. We're at 29 A.D. They started building back on the temple. They have built the port. The porch has already been built. It's a porch that goes around the temple. It's not like what Solomon had built. And he's out there speaking on this porch. And it's wintertime. And the Pharisees come up to him. And here's what they say. Now the Jews then gathered around him. Now remember in John when it says Jews, it's talking about Jewish leadership, which is the Sanhedrin. They gathered around him and were saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are in Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. He brings the topic back up from a year and three months before. You do not believe because you do not belong to me, he sang. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. You don't belong to me because you don't hear my voice. The blind man couldn't see, but Jesus asked him, Do you want to see? Yes, I do. He spits on the ground. He puts it on. All he can do is hear, and he believes that he can heal him. And he goes and he washes in the pool because he told him to do it. He washes and he sees. And these Pharisees cannot see because they can't hear him because they don't want to hear him because they've heard everything in Moses. That was in last week's lesson. Where they, we've heard the law of Moses. Well, Jesus is going to get them on their own terms. In fact, he goes on to say, I and the Father are one. Well, they are just upset with that. They're going to stone him. They tried to stone him before he got out of the, out of the temple to heal the blind man a year and three months before. Now they're going to stone him again. What are they going to stone him for? Back there, they were going to stone him because he healed on the Sabbath. They were going to stone him because of the, of the blind man because he told the blind man to pick up his pallet and walk. Now they're going to change their story. They're going to lie. Look at him. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus said, hey, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? And they said to him, For good works we do not stone you. Well, that's a lie because that's what they were going to do the last two times. Now they say, But for blasphemy and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Well, that's not proof enough because he's already said, You want to know if I'm God? I've already told you enough to tell you that I'm God. And he didn't believe me. Oh, you make yourself out to be God. So Jesus is saying he's God. The Pharisees are saying that he is God. Look on verse 34, and Jesus answered them, 
Has it not been written in your law, I said, you are God's? Has it not been written? Okay. Now don't take that like some of our other religions say we're God's or we're little Christ. We're not little Christ, folks. We're Christians. We abide in Christ. We are not Christ. We live portraying His name, taking on His name, that we don't want to do anything because we need to remember who our Father is and who our Savior is. And everything we do, we need to do as if we're doing it for Him. But we are not little Christ and we are not little gods and we will never be gods. And in fact, he is, he is hitting them with their own tactic on their own field when He says, Is it not said in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. I, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father." He just hammered them. It's in Psalms chapter 82, verse, starts with verse 1. In Psalms 82, it's a prophecy about Jesus coming, the Messiah coming, to hammer those who are lording over like gods over the people. God takes His stand in His own congregation. There in the congregation of the Jews, God is going to take His stand. God the Son, by the way, He judges in the midst of the rulers. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Now, Selah is a musical term. It means stop and ponder on everything that just happened. It's like a grand pause. It goes along, the music goes along, and then it comes to this stop, and the music rings out through the uh, auditorium, and it dies down, and then you pick up with the next phrase. It's like a grand pause. It's stop and look at that. Think about what's just happened. Vindicate the weak and the fatherless, he says. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are God's, little g, and all of you are sons of the most, uh, most high. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princesses. Arise, O God, judge this earth, for it is you who possesses all the nations. This is not a good thing that he has said to them. They are lording over the people concerned about themselves and not the, the sheep. And he, Jesus, don't y'all say in your law that you're God's? Well, they knew that he was slapping them in the face. They knew this was not a positive thing. But he goes on to say, therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. Where does he go? And he went again away on beyond the Jordan to take place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. So he slipped over to the Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, not the Bethany just outside of Jerusalem, but the Bethany that's on the other side of the Jordan. And there he stays for a little bit, and the people are marveling. Look what they say. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no signs, yet everything John said about this man is true. Many believed in him there. So while he's at the Bethany on the Jordan, on the other side of the Jordan, the people say, look, John started here. He didn't do any miracles. He didn't do any signs. But he did point to Jesus, and everything he said about Jesus is absolutely true and is, go and is happening. And so Jesus goes over there, and many come to know him as Lord. The crowd is getting bigger. And over the next four months, it's, it's about four months until Jesus will die. The next four months, Jesus actually goes back up to Galilee, and if you remember that from in the Luke study too, and these events that I've listed down at the bottom of the page occur actually over about the next month, month and a half, sometime into late January, early part of February, and then Jesus is going to be given word or sent word that his friend Lazarus is not doing well, is sick. Jesus will slowly make his way down. He will not come quickly. He will slowly make his way down so that Lazarus will actually die and then he'll go and he'll raise him from the grave so that the glory of God will be seen. If you don't think you wonder, if we wonder why the man was blind since birth, 
Now that one's hard to understand. That's on my checklist to ask God about, why God planted it that way. I don't imagine I'll get to ask that question, but it's still on my checklist of my wonders. But I do understand why he allowed Lazarus to die. He allowed Lazarus to die to show his glory. He's already raised two people from, from the dead. He's fixing to raise Lazarus, his final resurrection before he is resurrected. And Lazarus will be raised from the dead somewhere between 30 and 60 days before Jesus dies on the cross. That's where we pick up next week when we come back in chapter 11 and pick up with John's story of telling us for the church to know, because John has written primarily to the church to know all of what was left, uh, what happened in the Judean ministry during about 18 months of ministry that's not recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Lord, we thank you so much for the words that are written in the pages of your Holy Scripture to fill us in on the things that we did not know. But more than all that, the one thing that we pray today for is that the leadership of not only our churches but also of our country and our towns and our cities um, be staffed with people who are not climbing in the windows and the roofs, but are coming through the door straight, leading us correctly. For those of us who are ministers and teachers, may we also lead the sheep through the correct door, not as thieves and robbers, but as shepherds of your holy gospel. In your son's name, amen.